today's agenda, we are going to start with a getting to know you activity because I don't really know you guys yet. So I have an activity that we'll do. It's a little piece of paper you'll fill out. It'll help me come up with rewards and stuff to keep here in the classroom. Then followed by that, we're gonna take a pretest. So there's gonna be some vocabulary and then I will read a passage to you and you guys have to answer 10 questions about it. Next half of class, we will do the seventh most important thing, okay. followed with our mind map and then hopefully get enough time at the end to have a little bit of a break. So when we open up at the front of that today, you will see your two activities for today. Your pretest and behind that is going to be where you're all about the activity is. So let's go ahead and get those out. So what we're going to do now is start by going out our papers. Start with the nice to meet you box. So your name, my name is Mrs. Borg, so then you'll put your name. What is black? Black, you guys are period eight slash nine. So that's what you're gonna put on that line. So preferred name, if you're middle name is what you go by, then I need to know that because that'll be yeah. different than what is placed in Skyward for me to look okay, at. So Jacoby George, but you want to go by Jacoby, you would put Jacoby. Do you want to go by Jacoby? Then put your name there. Wait. Yeah, that's fine. You don't need to do it. 
she going to tell you now what she wants to say. All right, my favorite class. Mine is ELA with you guys. Favorite class. Good job. Science. No, I already have this done. Good job. What's your favorite foods? Write them down. We have one, two, three.
and tray. Okay, so next we are going to start reading the seventh most important thing. Okay. Can anybody tell me what happened in the last chapter that we read? Who remembers? Oh, Hunter. Oh, man. Remember your friend, she said. 
which was really sweet of her, Arthur thought, even if seeing the silver temperature knob from the toaster almost made him bust up and start crying. Okay, so what happened? How is he feeling? Sad? Hunter? Looks better. What? Looks better. Yeah, yeah, he's feeling very sad. So Arthur. Now we'll read chapter 42. On Saturday, Arthur went to see Ruby Jim. He didn't really want to go, but he wasn't sure if Ruby Jim had heard about Mr. Hampton, and he wanted to check what was happening with the garage. So she went and worried and told his mom he was going to the library to look up something for a school project. What's the project, she asked. Arthur scrambled to come up with something, parts of the cell. His mom didn't oh, look as if she believed him, but she let him go. Hey, kiddo, you're here early, Groovy Jim said cheerfully when Arthur walked in. He was eating a bowl of popcorn, and even though it was only 10 o'clock in the morning, what's up? Right then, Arthur knew the guy hadn't heard. Arthur tugged at the front of his hair nervously. Now that he was standing there, he didn't want to be the one to tell Groovy Jim the news. He wasn't even sure how to start. He hated using words like died or passed away. It's about Mr. Hampton, he said slowly. Groovy Jim looked at Arthur, his face suddenly serious. What's wrong? Has something happened to him? When Arthur didn't answer right away, he said, geez, oh Pete, he's gone, isn't he? Yes, Arthur mumbled. Standing up, Groovy Jim slowly walked to the front window of his shop. He stood there for a few minutes, shaking his head and rubbing his eyes. When did it happen? He asked finally. Tuesday morning, Arthur answered. Man, I can't believe it, he said, staring out the window. I just can't believe it. I hadn't seen Hampton around this week, but I didn't think anything was wrong. That crazy old man was such a good guy, a real good guy. Arthur had no idea why he chose this moment to admit what he'd done to Mr. Hampton, but the confession came pouring out before he could stop it. You know, I was the kid who hit him last fall, he blurted out. That's why I was working for him. Groovy Jim's reaction took him by surprise. The guy turned around and gave a sly smile. Don't worry, kiddo. I knew who you were the minute you walked into my shop back in December. I was in court the day you were sentenced. I drove Hampton to the courthouse, told him I'd be there to support him. Arthur stared at Groovy Jim in disbelief. He'd been in court the day he was sentenced. He knew the whole story. Why didn't you ever tell me that? Groovy Jim shrugged. You didn't say anything to me, did you? So I guess we all have our secrets, don't we? Arthur had to admit this was true. There was a lot he'd kept from Groovy Jim. Groovy Jim went back to his chair behind the counter and sat down, still looking shaken up by the news. Finally, he said, well, thanks for coming here to tell me about Hampton, kiddo. I know it wasn't an easy thing to do. Arthur reached into his pocket for the piece of paper he had brought along. I have something else to ask you. Arthur reached into his pocket for the piece, oh, sorry. He glanced in the direction of the garage. I promised Mr. Hampton I wouldn't let anything happen to his artwork. So I was wondering if you could let me know if someone comes in to move it or something. He said, holding out the folded paper. I wrote my number down here for you. Groovy Jim was surprised. Nobody knows what's happening with this stuff. Arthur shook his head, no. He tried asking Officer Billy about it, he told Groovy Jim. The day before he called, to tell her again how Mr. Hampton had left some very important projects in his garage and was worried about what would happen to them. 
but she'd insisted there wasn't much she could do. Unless Mr. Hampton wrote his wishes down, these things are complicated, she'd said. So are there any plans for a funeral or a memorial for him? Ruby Jim asked. Arthur said he'd heard that there were some relatives in South Carolina where Mr. Hampton was from and he might be buried there, but that was all he knew. Groovy Jim sighed. Too bad he didn't have family here. Yeah, Arthur agreed. There was another long silence. So you'll let me know if anything happens, right? He repeated. Groovy Jim nodded. Don't worry, I'll keep an eye on things. The project meant a lot to Hampton. I know you worked hard on it too. But Arthur watched nervously as Groovy Jim shoved the folded piece of paper under his cash register door. Would he remember where he put the number? Would he watch the garage like he said? Would he call? Arthur knew he couldn't be there 24 hours a day. He couldn't stand guard over the artwork. Trust didn't come easily to him, but he had to trust Groovy Jim would do what he said. A few days later, Groovy Jim kept his promise. Someone called for you, Arthur's sister announced when he came in from shooting baskets outside. She was mix mixing a pitcher of tang in the kitchen. Although she'd only been He'd only been outside for a short time. She'd already managed to spill powder and ice cubes everywhere. Who was it? Arthur asked, getting annoyed by the mess. His sister looked upward. I think he said his name was Gloomy Jim. It took a minute for Arthur to register what his sister was saying. You mean Groovy Jim? She shrugged. I guess. Arthur's heart began to pound. What did he say? He said you need to come to the garage right away because something is happening. Barbara put her hands on her hips, squinting suspiciously at Arthur. Who's Gloomy Jim, and what garage is he talking about? I'll tell you later, he said. After making his sister promise she'd stay inside while he was gone, he took off running, desperately hoping he wasn't too late. So why do we want to write about this all time? Digital. Nope, I don't think so. But we will get at least one more chapter in today. So, what can we write about? DJ, what do you think? Ruby Jim. Mm -hmm. What about Ruby Jim? What did he find out? was worried about the garage. We need to draw the picture of the garage. Yeah. Okay. What should we draw then? The garage. The garage being open, you yeah. think? Okay, so we have the garage. And here's the door. And you can see all kinds of stuff inside. Like a little box.
Anybody get that one written down? No. No, still working on it? No problem. Okay. yanked his shoulder out of Groovy Jim's grip. You were supposed to watch the garage, he shouted. All right, well, let's just talk things out over with this guy. I'm sure we can figure something out. Groovy Jim turned toward the other man and introduced Arthur to him. Arthur, this is Tony. He's the landlord who owns the garage. It took a minute for those words to sink in. The guy in front of him owned the garage. Hey, kid, the landlord looked at Arthur uneasily as if he was afraid he might completely flip out. I didn't mean to upset you. I had no clue that the things in the garage were. I just came here to clean up the place and get it ready for renting out. I didn't know it was some guy's stuff. It's the throne of the third heaven, Arthur shot back, not some guy's stuff. The landlord looked like a gangster, greased back dark hair, a thick gold chain around his neck, fake smile. Arthur didn't believe a word he was saying. Arthur worked on the project with the man who died, Groovy Jim explained. He was kind of second in charge of creating the masterpiece with him. The landlord, landlord looked at the two of them like they were lunatics. The, the thing is made out of junk, right? He said, glancing back at the pieces in the garage as if he wasn't quite sure they were talking about the same thing. First of all, it's not junk, Arthur said, his voice rising. It started on an island in World War II with things from an island. It started with death in war. His voice grew louder and shakier, and you could tell he was on the verge of losing it. Jamming his hands in his pockets, he stared at the gravel under his feet. He had to get a grip. He was the director of special projects for the state of eternity. Mr. Hampton was counting on him. He couldn't fall apart. Look, the landlord said impatiently, I don't know what the old guy was building here. You say it's supposed to be some masterpiece. I have no idea what's art and what's not. It looks like junk to me, but I'm no judge. You pay the rent and I don't care what you do. You can build whatever crazy stuff you want. The throne of the third heaven, Arthur said again, not stuff. How much, Ruby Jim asked. The landlord crossed his thick arms. Hampton paid 50 a month, but April and May weren't paid up, so I'll need 100 back for back rent. After that, it's 50 a month. Arthur's heart sank. 
$100 and then 50 a month after that, where would he get that kind of cash? Ruby Jim asked, if I give you 50 right now, could you give us a week or two to figure out what we want to do next, given the circumstances and all? Arthur's eyes started toward Ruby Jim. He didn't think he had that kind of money. Sure, I'm a reasonable guy, the landlord nodded. For a gangster, Arthur thought. Feeling guilty that he didn't even have a dollar to contribute, Arthur watched as Ruby Jim emptied all the cash from his wallet and gave it to the guy. Then he had to go and clean out the cash register in his shop and the spare change jar on the counter to finally make it to 50 bucks. Take until the end of May to make up your mind, the man said, shoving a handful of bills and coins into his pocket. The end of May was less than three weeks away. And I'm sorry again for messing up the guy's work, he added. I'm just a regular guy who rents out buildings. I don't know much about art and culture and stuff like that, okay? Arthur almost believed the guy was sorry. He would have believed it for sure if the guy hadn't taken all of Ruby Jim's money. You'll leave everything alone until the end of May, he asked the landlord just to be sure. You won't come back? Not unless you burn the place down, kid, the guy joked. Arthur didn't even crack a smile. After the landlord finally left in his rattling truck, Arthur turned to Groovy Jim. He took all your money, he said, feeling sick. Groovy Jim shook his head and laughed. No big deal. It's not the first time somebody's taken all my money. Probably won't be the last time either. Now let's get heaven put back together. They started rebuilding Mr. Hampton's creation as carefully as they could. The gold throne chair with its big set of shimmering wings was first. And around it, they arranged the dozens of intricate tables and pedestals and pillars. Arthur remembered where a lot of the pieces went and thought Squeak, being Squeak, would probably remember even more. Luckily, a lot of the bigger pieces had wheels on them, which was something he had never noticed before. Heaven on wheels, Arthur thought. His dad would have loved the idea. Okay, so what do we want to write about? Oh, uh, I'm putting heaven back together. Okay. Hunter? The landlord comes just to pick up the stuff. Uh-huh. Okay. You have your hands raised in here. <laughs> that I saw it at the corner of my eye. So yeah, we're gonna write. We're gonna write about. Hmm. Oh, I actually can't quite walk back. Okay, so first we have landlord wanted to clean out the garage. Oh. Yes, TJ. The gold throne. The golden throne. So they were putting it back together? Yeah. Okay. So if they put heaven back together. Is this the last chapter? No, is it? Starting with the throne. Okay, so we'll put two, the garage in, stuff inside, and then the throne with its wings. Say again. Go ahead and keep that one in your binder. 